Welcome to Surgeon's Log 2021, Case Archives of the Skull Base and Beyond, a webinar presented by the North American Skull Base Society in association with Global Brain Surgery Initiative. I'm your host, Dr. Walter Jean. If you've enjoyed this and other episodes, don't forget to click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any future episodes. For now, let's get ready for yet another exciting and entertaining episode of Surgeon's Law 2021. Okay, good morning, everybody um, in the United States. Uh, good afternoon for the Europeans and uh, good evening for all of Asian followers. Uh, welcome to uh, another episode of Surgeon's Law 2021. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us today. As a case-driven webinar, we're once again very indebted to the presenting surgeon who uh, brings us the case. Uh, without the cases, we are nothing. Uh, today's presenting surgeon is Ken Matsushima from Tokyo Medical University. Um, you may recognize the last name. Uh, he he has, comes from a long lineage of neurosurgeons, and um, he will be our uh, presenting surgeon with a wonderful case coming out of uh, Japan. Um, our uh, special guest discussant uh, does not require any uh, 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 announcements or introductions. Professor Carl Hyman, a uh, longtime chairman uh, of neurosurgery at Tufts Medical University, at Tufts Medical Center, uh, former president of this society, the North American Skull Base Society, and I think just stepping down as president of the ABNS. Uh, so uh, for all of you all just passed your exams, uh, you have a signature, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, so so that's uh, Dr. Heilman. Um, and uh, on the hot seat today uh, is Stefan Lieber, um, finishing the time zone coverage from east to west. Uh, he is in the middle, uh, uh, currently in Paris, uh, former trainee at um, Tübingen, yes? Mm -hmm. um, uh, with uh, Marco Satajiba and now uh, with my friend uh, um, uh, Sebastian Frolik in uh, Hôpital Larry Brasier, um, and he does not know this case, and he will be verbalizing his thoughts so that the audience can think along as he goes through this case. So again, let's, without further ado, we're going to start with Stefan on the hot seat uh, on a, in an episode called Petra Part 2. So Stefan, uh, the case coming out of Tokyo is a 28-year-old woman with a chief complaint of progressive right-sided hearing loss and uh, tinnitus. Uh, she also has the complaint of a slight right-sided facial sensory impairment, um, which all seem to make sense with co going around with the right-sided hearing loss. Um, this is the audiogram, um, and it's still usable, but it's definitely diminished. Oh, no, it's unserviceable. Sorry, class D on the right side. Um, sensory impairment uh, as is, and uh, other cranial nerves are all intact as uh, is the motor and um, uh, sensory uh, for the body. Um, I think I'm gonna cut to the chase and, and look, show you the imaging right away. Here's the first set of studies. And I'm gonna show you the next slide before yeah. I give ask for comments. All right, so Stefan, your first thoughts. Yeah, before we start, um, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a, it's a great honor and I very much, very much like the format of this session and I've been following over the recent month. Thank you very much. So we're looking at um, various modalities, um, obviously a CT, a T2 or a somewhat Fiesta cis weighted imaging and an SWI. And this is a uh, clearly extra axial lesion um, predominantly in the posterior fossa, but extending through the porous trigeminis into the middle fossa, or more specifically into Meckelscape um, on the right. There is some, um, yeah, there is some uh, uh, some enhancement. Obviously, it's a very mottled signal, um, but a clearly extra axial lesion on the left side. The uh, basal artery can be seen pushed posterolaterally, contralaterally. Um, and obviously there's a lot of mass effect from this lesion, which only, I don't think it extends um, beyond the tentorium, but the tentorium is slightly pushed upwards and displaces the, um, the uncus um, laterally, supralaterally. All right, so let's uh, move on to the next. So what do you think it is and what would you like to do next? Well, this, um, it, this could be um, 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 some sort of trigeminal schwannoma. This could be uh, a meningioma. This could be, um, I don't think it's um, 
judging by the by the signal and and um, only displaced chronically displaced and not eroded bone this is uh, most likely not some sort of um, uh, um, chordoma or chondrosarcoma um, but this is not ruled out with this image might be looking at some diffusion or some uh, some other studies uh, so some... so I, I would agree schwannoma meningioma um, does it matter um does it matter? I, I would think it matters because meningioma in this uh, in this uh, region, this would be um, probably well. This is this this would be a petroclival meningioma, a sizable one. This is a young woman, so certainly at some point surgery is not out of the uh, would be necessary at some point. Um, generally, surgery could be uh, awaited until uh, more obvious symptoms appear. I don't see any. This is not a classical flare image, but there's no obvious edema, no obvious. Yeah, but problems. before before we get to your goals of treatment, yeah, yeah. if it's a meningioma versus a schwannoma, does it does it change? I guess what I'm asking is, does it change your goal of treatment or anything? Does, does it really matter whether it's a meningioma or a schwannoma from the early goal, from the early stages of your thinking process? Um. Well, for, for the general um, idea of, of um, here predominantly decompressing the, the posterior fossa and the shift of the brainstem, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, right, so, so what do you want to do next? You have the CT, you have the MRI. Yeah, so uh, did I get this right? So there was some complete hearing loss. There was some hypesthesia. So there is, uh, is, uh, there is a seven, there is a five. Hypesthesia, facial pain. It's not complete hearing loss, it's class D, and uh, you know, it's uncertain. Let's say, just say it's non serviceable, uh, and there are sensory changes on uh, as well. But otherwise, cranial nerves for the cavernous sinus and Meckel's cave were not affected, right? That's correct. That's okay. correct. Okay. Um, well, osteostructures within the petrous bone are not um, affected, and the main problem uh, here, although there's no um, flare hype intensity or obvious. Uh, edema is compression of the of the posterior fossa and the, and the brainstem. All right, so what, what do you want to do next? Uh, well, given a tumor of this size, I would always be interested in some sort of um, advanced vascular imaging. So with us, uh, we always do a DSA, exactly, just to see um, whether there's um, encasement, narrowing, um, or just plainly looking at the, um, the vascular supply and also the venous, uh, the venous outflow. Uh, you see a little bit of blush, but not much, and uh, the rest is uh, on, on the screen there. Yeah. Not a whole lot to say about that, right? All right, so let's move forward yeah. again uh, for this. Now, I always ask this question, uh, you know, Stefan, you're a fellow. Um, when, you're, when you're teaching your younger trainees and, and younger uh, uh, colleagues, what are your eyes drawn to? What are you paying attention to before we even talk about you know, treatment and whatnot? Well, given a, given the tumor and this localization and this this size, I would first look um, whether there's obvious um, obvious issues, um, obvious destruction either in the petrous bone or in the in the adjacent brainstem, which is uh, not the case here. Obviously, there is a lot of a lot of displacement, but no signal alter, signal alterations. Then I would be looking at the adjacent vasculature, obviously the, the basilla, probably ICA and potentially opica is probably too long, but certainly ICA and SCA are somewhat entangled in this. Then uh, oculomotor nerve, uh, I would be interested with the oculomotor nerve is where the oculomotor nerve is running here. This is uh, not obvious from this imaging. And then five, obviously, whether it's medial, whether it's lateral, um, cannot really be perceived. Um, and it comes back to the question whether this is a meningioma, or whether this is a schwannoma. Right, uh, perfect. Uh, excellent. So, so first thing you said, look at the bony destruction. There is bony <laughs> destruction in the in the petroclival junction, at least. And which always pay attention. Widening of the porous trigeminus. Exactly. Which, always pay attention to the basilar, where that thing is, and yeah. and also the cranial caudal dimension. Right. Where does it get down to? Where does it go up to? Uh, those are the kind of things that you pay attention to when you start yeah. thinking about this. So the first question uh, always to to define and and write down in stone what is your goal of treatment in the twenty eight year old woman with non-serviceable hearing? Well, as I said, in a 28-year-old, 20, uh, obviously the um, surgery is, is indicated, whether it's, whether it's now or whether it's uh, soon, whether there's a, a small period of follow-up um, possible, that's, that's another question, but certainly there's some, some surgery involved at some point. 
Um, assuming this is a benign lesion, um, one would probably focus, or one should focus on a maximal safe uh, resection. Yeah, but um, before that, I think I, I would put that number two. What, what is your goal number one? In terms of further diagnostics or? No, Go, goal of treatment number one. It, it has to be decompression of the brainstem, right? Yes. It goes with the maximum safety resection, but goal well, number one has yeah, got to be decompression of brainstem. That's what I meant earlier, saying that the, you, the, you said that, right? Mostly, so, mostly um, positioned in the posterior fossa run, rather than the extension in the intermical So two is maximum safe uh, 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 resection. Any other goals? Number three, number four, anything? Well, maximal safe uh, resection means not not causing any any harm, no, not, um, yep. not um, causing any for any cranial morbidity, cranial nerve morbidity, um, which is um, yeah, this would be the right. of, uh, goal of the surgery. Yeah. So now comes the interesting, the the beginning to get to the high 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 dollar questions, the five thousand dollar question, ten thousand dollar questions. Your options. Let's lay them all down on the table here. Yeah, so I would, I mean, the, the cranial caudal extension is significant. As I said, I don't think that the tentorium is, is that there's breach of the tentorial surface, but this, so the tentorium is certainly pushed upwards and potentially infiltrated, and there's some sort of extension into the middle fossa. I don't know. There's certainly tumor within Meckel's cave, although we don't have any clinical symptoms for that. Um, but then from cranial caudal extension from the tentorium right down to um, the pontum is an junction. This is certainly the level of uh, the jugular tubercle. So this is out of reach for a for a just simply an anterior petrosectomy, which would be nice for the for the macroscape extension and the superior um, aspect of it. Um, it's medial, obviously, going contralateral also. Um, the basal is pushed uh, into a favorable position. I don't know whether again, uh, whether five is um, origin of this or whether five is just entangled medially or laterally in this tumor. But then uh, I don't uh, think that um, the interior petrosectomy is, is uh, enough for the inferior aspect. Certainly then it's, you know, there needs to be added more. Um, so, like a co so you're thinking about a combo treatment? Yeah, I, I would think, I mean, just looking at this uh, superior third, middle third, and potentially a bit of the inferior third of the, the rule of thirds for the posterior fossa, this um, is probably in Sebastian's sense, this would be treated with a combined uh, petrosectomy. So anterior um, petrosectomy, sparing, posterior petrosectomy, retrolabyrinthine. Retrolabyrinthine sparing, sparing uh, the auditory system, yes. Okay. All right, so, you know, this, this is a topic that's uh, passionate for, for myself as well as Sebastian. Uh, the, the rule of thirds is right here, right? Uh, this is how we were taught in Cincinnati, both of us. Uh, the, the top part of the clivus, petrial clival junction, anterior petrosectomy, the middle part of the uh, uh, clivus, uh, posterior petrosectomy, and then the, maybe the far lateral kind of approach in the, in the la, uh, bottom third. Um, the, the, the problem is that you you definitely have this component in the orange that that requires some sort of a underneath the temporal low anterior petrosectomy kind of a thing. And I completely agree with, with Stefan that, at least on first glance, uh, the, the yellow portion here is, uh, I wouldn't bank on the, the anterior petrosectomy being enough. Um, it, it turns out that it's becoming a little bit fuzzy as to these rule of thirds, that the anterior petrosectomy can get to the uh, zone two and then posterior petrosectomy obviously can get to zone one. Uh, we even talk about using that for posterior clinoid um, and angiomas and even sometimes craning for angiomas for that. So, so those, those, you know, these boundaries of, of zone one with this and zone two with that are obviously very fuzzy sort of things um but, but give, given given that yeah, go ahead yeah given that you have this component in the meckles cave and also it goes down so low i would have thought that a combination uh, i agree with stefan that a combination treatment is necessary now the other the other thing is this though if you're doing a combined petrosectomy and therefore a retro labyrinthine posterior petrosectomy here's the problem she has a very narrow window for the retro lab. And even with the trans lab, her, her window is extremely narrow uh, from the sigmoid sinus to the, to the back edge of the IAC. And my concern about combining the anterior petrosectomy with a retro labyrinthine posterior petrosectomy is that you, you're going to have a huge uh, um, area that's blinded to you in a central clival depression. Uh, again, this is um, a very passionate topic for me because as a plug, this is coming out in, in August in the focus uh, uh, issue. Um, 
So a uh, topic that we've we'll studied very well. So I'm concerned about the anterior and posterior com combination. We, we may have to do the stage as an anterior retro sig combination or, or something like that. We'll, we'll see what, uh, what Ken did in, in a little bit. All right, so back to this question, Stefan, um, after my diversion, digression here, what is your final answer for this uh, question? Well, given her age, given her function, uh, functioning auditory system, I think the, the more interior aspects of the posterior transpetrosal approaches, uh, transcochlear and such, they are out of the window. This is not an option here. Yep. Um, well, the, yeah, the, this could be staged, although I would still be, still be starting with the posterior fossity compression. Um, yeah, we, we haven't seen a lot of Petrus Petrus bone anatomy in this. Uh, we just have this this axial cut with the uh, right, with the right. Anatomy. So, yeah, I, I would I would still um, reiterate um, and and say that this is probably not enough for, for an anterior petrosectomy. There needs to be more exposure in the posterior fossa. Okay, so what are you going to start with? You're going to start with the. Yeah, oh, you're going to do a combined. You're going to do a combined anterior petrosectomy, posterior petrosectomy, retro lab. I mean, this being a young patient, this this extending uh, very much laterally, um, um, right to the porous trigeminus on the contralateral side. I don't think um, just a, a, a large decompression via retro sigmoid approach is a good idea. I would think this is a bit too too narrow and too risky, um, given given the space of this lesion and and a very young patient. Um, but then I'm, I, I mean, I've, I've seen many combined transpetrosal approaches. I've no uh, experience with them doing myself. I would not be uh, be able to judge the angles and the specific vitreous bone anatomy in this case. Okay. Um, so, so one one thing to, to add here is that when Sebastian does this as a combined case, he does pull that transverse sigmoid junction and tentorium back a little bit. So, so he he does create more room by releasing that transverse sigmoid junction so that he does have a little bit more room than I showed you in that slide with the pink and the yellow. Um, so it, it would, it, it pro probably would work. All right, so for your final answer, the goal of treatment is for brainstem decompression and maximum safe resection. Your choice is anterior and posterior petrosectomy combined in one stage. Uh, I think I would do this because the, the anterior, the addition of the anterior petrosectomy nicely tackles both the problem in macroscape and also the uh, tentorial with the tentorial cut or to the uh, tentorial, either push upward tentorium or the tentorial infiltration. All right, fantastic. Uh, Ken, it's now your time, uh, your turn to tell us how you did it and your masterful work here. Uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Actually, this is a case that we we, I mean, Professor Connor and our team cannot distinguish between meningioma and schwannoma. There is no dual tail sign. There is no intertumor calcification. There is no hyperosteosis instead of slide bone erosion around the macroscape as you see, as you see in the images. So it looks like schwannoma, but there is no spotty signal voids in SWI. And this is a typical feature of meningioma in, in the schwannoma, usually we can see uh, multiple so signal voids in SRI, and there is no tumor stain in angiogram. So we cannot dis we 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 couldn't distinguish the meningioma and schwannoma. And to select the approaches, I think it's important point that it is meningioma or schwannoma because if it is schwannoma which is usually originated from the nerve, uh, we can pull, down, pull out the tumor while preserving the dissection plane, even if it is deeply located, right? Okay. If it is trigeminal ner nerve schwannoma, we thought it's enough, the anterior petrosectomy is enough for reset. I see. So the logic is that uh, a petroclobal meningioma will be attached to the dura of the mm -hmm. petroclival region and therefore need mm -hmm. more exposure than schwannoma, which is more mobile. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And our primary diagnosis was trigeminal nerve schwannoma. So I know it's a little bit too low to get the enough space from the anterior petrosectomy, but if it is schwannoma, we thought 
it's possible to reject all the tumor through the anterior pterostomy. And, and also the, the, the advantages of, the, one of the advantages of anterior pterostomy for the trigeminal nerve schonomer is the, the intact trigeminal fiber can be usually found at the lateral surface of the trigeminal nerve schwannoma when approaching through the anterior pterostomy. So we can catch first, we can catch the intact trigeminal nerve first and preserve it during the resection of the trigeminal nerve schwannoma. And if you can preserve the intact fiber, we sometimes experience the improvement of the facial sensory disturbance. And also, as as the professor said, we never damage the, the hearing structures, even it is unserviceable, even the patient had unserviceable hearing disturbance because we often experienced the its improvement. I, I think around more than 30% of the patient who has unserviceable hearing function. Yeah, and, and that's that's and a point that, that's worth it, it, emphasizing. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, especially your group with with Professor Kono at the Tokyo Medical University. You guys have always preached that even with bad cranial nerve functions, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes decompression of the cranial nerves actually restores the functions. So don't give mm -hmm. up on them uh, uh, mm -hmm. that early, uh, especially yeah. for ju jugular foramen schwannomas with hearing, and in this case, tr uh, trigeminal schwannoma with, with hearing. So yes. uh, with, with that thought, you, your thought was that it was a schwannoma and therefore you chose this. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So we chose the anterior transpetrosal approach under SCP, MEP, auditory brain stimulus response, and, and EMGs of third, fourth, sixth, fifth and seventh cranial nerves. And we put the patient uh, on the park bench position the, uh, and the vertex tilted downward. And we put the question mark to skin incision. And another great point to emphasize that you're using gravity to help you with the temporal lobe there. Um, uh, any lumbar drain? Uh, yes, we put the lumbar drain on. Okay. Yeah. And here's your video. Okay. Uh, we put the skin incision and, and after cutting big layer, you can see the loose areola tissue. And this loose areola tissue has been recently reported its hypervascularity and it's good for reconstruction, especially reported by plastic surgeons. So we made the flap consisted of this loose areola tissue while preserving the temporal fascia. And we cut the fascia and muscle together and it, you can avoid the, the long-term atrophy of the muscles in this way. And we put the, we open the temporal craniotomy. And apply the microscope. And here is the middle, deep, middle base and we coagulate it and cut the middle meningeal artery and dissected the GSPN as usual. And here is the Petras apex and arcuate eminence. And from the foramen ovary, we did the intradural dissection. The anterior part of the Kawase's triangle was already destroyed by the tumor, but we drilled the posterior part of the Kawase's triangle at this point, the audio for the webinar has some difficulty, so I will continue the narration for Dr. Matsushima. The subtemporal dura was opened, and perpendicular to that, the posterior fossa dura was opened as well after ligation of the superior petrosal sinus. The tentorium is then cut towards the incisura with the care that the trochlear nerve is not damaged. The dura of the Meckel's cave was then opened and then tumor was debulked from within that capsule. The fifth nerve coming off the brainstem was seen to be intact. 
the carotid artery was delineated using the ultrasound. And the tumor was stepwise dissected away from the brainstem and all the cranial nerves. Here's the sixth nerve on the left. Ocular motor nerve on the left. and the major posterior circulation blood vessels. The ipsilateral abducens nerve was quite attenuated by the tumor. We also opened the internal auditory meatus from the top. So you can see it is extended middle force approach. And the, the tumor adhesion to the nerve is carefully dissected. We're controlling the bleeding. Here's the, the opposite sixth nerve and the basilar artery on the midline. It, it's mobile, it's over the middle line and it buzzes our tip by forgetting bilateral PCA and right SCA. We're preserving all the cranial nerves and controlling the bleeding by the surgical. We resected the tumor by piecemeal fashion. and completely resected. We couldn't identify any dural attachment, but the pathological diagnosis was meningioma. Here is the virtual artery, the opposite abducens nerve, vaginal tip. Now, that's an important point here, Ken. So you did yes. not you did not find an attachment of this tumor at the petroclival fissure mm. or, or any of the you know, anterior dura. No. And we did the dura reconstruction by the by the flap. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> and the, she has slight diplopia after the surgery, but the hearing disturbance improved completely to from from class D to class A, and she didn't have any event after the surgery. And the pathological diagnosis was clear cell meningioma. And post op MRI confirmed total, total resection of the tumor. And she didn't have, she doesn't have any recurrence at two years for up without any additional treatment. Thank you. All right, so Ken, how, how, how believable do you think the pathological diagnosis of, of not a schwannoma but a meningioma is? You, you trust that, right? Yes. Okay. During the surgery, yes. Um, so it's a little bit odd not to find an attachment on the dural side, right? Mm -hmm. You agree mm -hmm. with that? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, that's a great point, that, that the schwannoma is much more mobile, so the, uh, the opening may not be as necessarily as large as a, as a petroclival meningioma. Um, mm. if, you, if, if you and your group thought that this was a petroclival meningioma, what would you have done in that case? Uh, you mean before the surgery or yeah, after before the surgery? surgery? If, if, you, if you had thought that this, in fact, was a petroclival meningioma, if you knew that ahead of time somehow, how would you have changed your plans? Uh, yeah, we may... Start with combined petrosal approach. Yes. Combined petrosal approach. Okay. Mm, probably. In um, this case, even it is even we believe it is genoma, we started the anterior petrosal approach with a backup of a combined petrosal approach. You know, you know, we we prepared to to extend the approach to the combined transpetrosal approach. 
I get this question a lot, so I'm going to show this slide uh, for the younger audience here. Uh, the con con confusion often lies with the anterior patriciectomy with the dural incisions. And you saw Ken doing this very expertly. The, the first cut is along the temporal lobe, uh, the base of the temporal lobe, and that's the cut in green. The, the next cut of the dura actually is this orange thing, which is perpendicular to the green cut, and it is the the lateral uh, aspect of the dural covering of the po posterior fossa next to the brainstem that, that he's cutting in that case. Then you ligate the superior petrosal sinus and you cut the tentorium towards the fourth nerve. And of course you have to look for the fourth nerve as he did point out to you that the fourth nerve is not available. So if anybody has any kind of confusion, this is figure five, five A in my book. Um, uh, another plug for that paper that's coming out next month uh, that we studied as uh, transpatrosal approaches. It turns out that the anterior putrecectomy, um, as opposed to my old way of thinking that anterior putrecectomy only gets you to zone one, it turns out that the anterior putrecectomy gets you to that contralateral, uh, to that basal artery in zone two, even when it's pushed to the opposite side quite well. And the data shows that in that paper. So, uh, you know, I'm starting to rethink it and, and I encourage Stefan to, to rethink it as well. It's not as clear cut with those rule of thirds as I've been taught, as you've been apparently been taught, that, that, that there's a lot of mixing of those zones uh, when it comes to real life tumors. Um, now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and ask uh, Professor Heilman to tell us uh, his wisdom and uh, how he would have done it, how he would have critiqued it. And uh, Carl, uh, please go ahead. It's, it's an honor to have you with us this morning. Sorry, right, well, may, I, may I just ask one more question, maybe? Oh, please, Stefan. For the, for the incision, whether, because my, my impression that this was also covered just in the discussion that the uh, anterior petrosectomy was done assuming this was a trigeminal schwannoma, um, which is indicated or suspicious um, or the assumed diagnosis from, from the vascular imaging. Um, but if, if the um, combined or a, or a more posterior, uh, the addition of a more posterior approach was considered, then the, the subtemporal incision for the, uh, or the, the subtemporal approach, the preauricular incision for the subtemporal approach, or was it, to, phrase it, to rephrase it, was it ever considered to, to take another incision in preparation for an extension um, for a posterior petrosectomy, or was this not not really considered, assuming there was a uh, trigeminal schwannoma soft enough mobilizing um, to be mobilized by just the anterior petrosectomy? I'm so, sorry. If... In the operative video show, you just have a pretty regular yes, yes, yes. incision for the... For the if we have to extend the... If we... If we ha have to add the posterior petrosectomy, we have to put the C-shaped incision retroauricular. You know, from the from the from the from the question mark to the to the mustard to the end of the mustard. Yeah. But it was not. It was not at this time. It was not considered it, either in the, as a one stage or two stage extension. Uh, we marked. We marked, but we didn't shave the the hair. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Carl. All right, well, first, uh, thanks for including me and asking me to comment. And uh, first, I just wanna congratulate both participants. I mean, fabulous discussion. Uh, Dr. Lieber, uh, Marcus Tejiba should be very proud. Uh, in 1993, I went to Hanover for a couple months to watch and he was a junior faculty member there. So I enjoyed getting to know him. He's done a great job training you, I can see. And Dr. Matsushima, that's a fabulous surgical technique. And I love watching your video and uh, uh, yeah, I think you should be proud of the result. That's a great, great outcome in that case. And uh, I'm going to just share my screen and show a few slides and then just tell you my thinking on things in this region and kind of what I've done or how I've started to um, manage these things. Let me just make sure. Uh, hold on here. So let me make sure you guys can see this. Yep. Uh, uh, you're in presenter mode. Yep. Perfect. How about that? Perfect. Good. All right, so I, interestingly, I had a case uh, almost exactly the same back in 1996. This also was a clear cell meningioma. And just for the audience, you know, clear cell meningiomas are less than 1% of, um, of meningiomas and have a worse prognosis, even though they don't have malignant features on histology. They have a higher recurrence rate, so they're called a grade two. But this gal had trigeminal symptoms, and I thought it was going to be maybe a trigeminal schwannoma, but it turned out to be a clear cell meningioma also. 
But how I've treated these over my career has changed. Early in my career, I loved the posterior transfer trozo approach, tried to find any case I could to do that. And that's what I did for this patient. Um, so um, here is, uh, I actually had positions, pictures of her in the operating room. This is back 25 years ago. So I did a posterior transfer trozo approach. And this is just the approach with the exposure of the posterior fossa and the middle fossa, temporalis, uh, temporalis muscle push forward. I like to do mastoidectomy first, drill a trough with a match head across the transverse sinus, a couple of small burr holes, connect these with a foot plate. And then just like you said, Walter, uh, when you open the dura here, when you open the pre-sigmoid dura, cut the superior petrosal sinus and split the tent, all of a sudden this sigmoid sinus will move posteriorly and you have a lot more room to see in there. So even though there's very little room between the labyrinthine block and the sigmoid, you make room as soon as you cut the tent, the sigmoid sinus will push back. But interestingly, this is what's happened in my career. These are my posterior transpetrosal approaches over my 27 years. I did a lot of them early and now I haven't done any in nine or 10 years, uh, mainly just because of the time it takes and uh, it's just such a long surgery. I've really morphed into loving the anterior petrosal approach, followed up by either gamma knife if I can't get the whole thing out or by a suboccipital approach in the second stage. And so I've morphed into doing way more anterior transpetrosal approach. This is the same graph just showing how many I've done over my 26, 27 years. And you can see I'm doing way more anterior transpetrosal approaches. And you know, I was just struck in my early career when you do a posterior transpetrosal approach, I usually work with ENT, and by the time I start taking out tumor, earliest I ever removed some tumor was 12:30 in the day, but sometimes it's one, sometimes it's two. When you do an anterior transpetrosal approach, 9:45 or 10, you're already starting to remove the tumor, and that puts your uh, micro dissection the freshest part of the day. You're not getting to something late at night, and uh, you know that's it's important. Uh, now. This slide was shown, this Roten dissection was shown by Dr. Matsushima, but I like to tell my residents, Dr. Roten always loved to talk about rule of threes, you know, uh, in the posterior fossa is all these rule of threes. Well, I always think of rule of fives for this approach. And that's because when I dissect the dura, I tell my residents I'm looking for five anatomical structures, mastoid tegmen, arcuate eminence, gatal plane, petrous apex, and trigeminal depression. So these five things, and usually, when I get to the trigeminal impression, uh, then I start to work forward, get the GSPN down, then divide middle meningeal, then cut the dura right here on B3, peel it up, and all of a sudden, then you have lots of room. So that's kind of my strategy. Go posterior, find those five structures. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, mastoid tegment, archidemis, meatal plane, petrous apex, then peel off GSPN, divide the middle meningeal, cut the dura right here. Once you peel the dura up off B3, now all of a sudden it's not so tight. The retractors aren't uh, uh, tight. And then I think of the drilling, you know, we talked about a triangle, but I tell my residents a rule of five here also. I'm thinking of drilling out this bone till I see five structures, posterior fossa dura, all along the trigeminal nerve, carotid artery, cochlea, and IAC dura. And so I just kind of think of it as, as these are my landmarks here when I'm doing the drilling there. The one thing you can't see is the cochlea. You don't want to drill into the to the cochlea, but everything else you can see and, uh, and determine. Now, the only comments I would make relative to how I like to do it, just different than Dr. Uh, Matsushima did, is uh, I do this case supine with a roll rather than the lateral position. Uh, I just found that any case that's going to take a long time, I'd rather have them be lying on their back with a bump on their shoulder rather than the pure lateral position for a long case. Just so you don't have any positioning related issues, but that's just one thought. Two, um, I use a straight line incision. The advantage of the question mark that Ken showed is it's easier to get anterior and get in front of foramen valley. But I tend to just use a straight line incision, straight line through the muscles and fascia. And then I kind of stop using perforators and the foot plate and just make the whole craniotomy with a match head just because Sometimes the inner table of the skull over the temporal lobe here is kind of uneven. And if you use a foot plate every once in a while, you get a dural tear in the case we're going to do extra durally. And I always found that annoying. So I just take a match out of the Midas, drill a rectangular bone flap right in a straight line, and then just go. So it's really quite fast. That's just one minor thing. 
Uh, I tend not to ever use a lumbar drain. I like the idea that as you're dissecting, the pressure of the CSF kind of spreads out the dissection extradurally. If you drain all the CSF, I always wonder if it's every time you push on the dura, are you pushing on the cortex of the temporal lobe more? So I just struggle with a little tighter posterior fossa dural tension uh, with no lumbar drain. That's just my thought. And finally, um, I don't do angiograms for this uh, ever, uh, just because I just study the T2. And to me, you can see all the big vessels on T2. And I think the blood supply is usually pretty similar. So I don't know. I just kind of got away from doing that on all cases. But those are all just minor things. But you know, it's cases like this, the anterior transpetrosal is perfect to get out of the Meckel's cave. And exactly like both of you had said, uh, trinomus you can mobilize. You know, you can um, come in from above and when you debulk the bottom, the schwannoma starts to come up and it's not adherent, which is not true with meningiomas like this image. If I had this image and I did an anterior transpetrosal approach, I know it's not really going to mobilize down here. So I would end up drilling out the IAC and getting this out here and probably end up leaving some if I did an anterior transpetrosal approach for that case. But on the other hand, a meningioma like this may be arising from the tent. You could get this whole thing out, anterior transpetrosal. You could probably get this whole thing out because this looks nice and smooth and round and you can drill out this bone. But something like this, you probably would end up either with a second stage or with radiosurgery. So that's kind of my thoughts. I think you guys did a fabulous job. Uh, one, discussing the case, two, presenting the surgical options, and uh, had a great result. I must say, I never used the SWI before to diagnose meningioma, so I was, I was happy to learn something from you guys on that. Uh, you know, uh, I just never even look at the SWI in a meningioma case, but uh, it's interesting that that's, I guess you're looking at speckled calcifications, which uh, have a paramagnetic effect on the SWI, I guess, making it different than schwannomas, but, um, you know, so I'll just stop there and stop sharing my screen. Uh, let me just see here and go that, back. That, to that, that's wonderful, Carl. Um, so, so let's go back to Ken's case. So you, you, you saw. Let's say that you're seeing the patient. You see that scan. Would you, would you uh, do anterior petrisectomy as a standalone? How, how much of a, a, a flexibility would you have left yourself with the posterior part? Uh, how would you have calculated that particular case? Yeah, you know. I would have done anterior transpetrosal approach. That's what I was thinking of when I went through the slides before I saw how uh, Ken actually treated it. But I spent a lot of time staring at the coronal images, trying to figure out, is this coming from the tentorium and then bulging down, in which case I can get it up? Or is it arising like carpeting along the petroclival dura? Yeah. I know I'm not going to get it. Now, if I know I'm not going to get it, the discussion, get it all, I might still do an anterior transpetrosal approach and tell the patient, you know, we might only get out 80 or 90% and then we can talk about whether what's left could just be treated with gamma knife or whether we should go back by suboccipital, you know. There, there are a lot of people that do that posterior transpetrosal approach in two days. I'd rather do an anterior transpetrosal approach and then rarely have to go back by suboccipital and plan a two day surgery in the first place. Uh, yeah. I've just been impressed on how many tumors you can get out by that anterior transpetrosal, how fast it is, how quick you're working on things. How easy it is to see the dura of the IAC, the fourth nerve, the fifth nerve. You can find the sixth nerve coming up if you lift up the trigeminal nerve right as it goes into porous trigeminus. So it's just so versatile and quick that I've just grown to like it more and more over time. But. So uh, the, the slide that you show about how your numbers of the uh, posterior petrosectomy have come down, I almost I saw the almost identical slide that Robert Spessler, when he gave a talk about this uh, topic, he, he, the barrel was the same thing, that the posterior transposotial is really coming down, the retro sigs going up. I think the frustration that we all seem to share is that that bony labyrinth really blocks your view. Uh, despite the mobilization of that transverse sigmoid junction, that bony labyrinth is just right in your way. Um, and it, it just, you know, gets, you know, it's so frustrating to deal with, whereas you don't have that with the anterior pe transpetro uh, petrosectomy, and then you also retro sig also. For the younger audience also, think about the retro sig as if you leave tumor, yes, you might leave tumor, it's on the PO side, on the brainstem side, whereas uh, the, the posterior petrosectomy, when you leave tumor, it might be a big hunk behind the labyrinth on the on the clival side, the dural side. That's another thing that we, we talk about sometimes. Um, 
Um, I do want to sh show, uh, since Dr. Harmon says that rule of five, I learned something new today about the rule of five. That's great. Uh, I want to share my screen about uh, this technology that we're using now to, to, to help us with the petrosectomy. And if everybody can see this. So I, I, I'm, I'm now relying on augmented reality to, to go get around that rule of five. So here's your Meckles cave. This is the right side. Uh, here's your Meckles cave. Here's the Petrus Ridge. Here's the Miedo Plain and everything posterior to it is right over here. Uh, if I can see with x-ray vision uh, with this augmented reality, then, then I, I can kind of uh, get away without looking at that posterior two uh, of the rule of five and just concentrate on this front part. So that's a, a fun little thing that we're now using to help with the safety. Uh, and furthermore, I don't drill into the older capsule anymore uh, going laterally because I have a visual cues for that. So that's just a little tidbit. Uh, Dr. Wong, anything to add on your set? How, how, how would you have done this, uh, do you think? Yeah, um, I think uh, I probably would have done this starting with a anterior petrosectomy and then thinking about going back with a retrosec for whatever I can't remove. Um, and it's, it's, it's for, I, I obviously haven't done nowhere near as many as Dr. Holman, but I found that the times I've done it, um, in one case, we didn't get to tumor until um, three o'clock in the afternoon with a combined uh, for these combined petrosectomy cases. And then, then another time, you know, we staged it as a two day where the first day was just all bony work and the second day was tumor. Um, and I also find found that the patients seem to not recover from a combined poster petrosectomy as well as I would expect um, for whatever reason as we have usually been taught that even though it's a long surgery, but if a lot of the surgery is extradural and bony removal, patients should do fine. Uh, but in my limited experience, I also found that recovery after a complete uh, or combined post uh, petrosectomy is, is very difficult for patients. Um, so I think I would have tried to start with, uh, see how much I could get through the anterior petrosectomy and then reserve the uh, uh, retro sig as a as a backup. Um, Ken, final thoughts. Any 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 uh, reaction to what Dr. Heilman said? Um, yeah, thank you very much for thoughtful advices, and I I agree to start with antipetrosexme, and and if it's impossible to total resection, it, it, yeah, we can add the retro sig and. Stefan, any, any learning points that you take home from this? Well, I, I, uh, as I said, um, um, this, this was an option to, to add the, this, uh, an, a nice point to add the retrosig just for further decompression of the posterior fossa. Just for me, because I mean this, for me looking at these images, I'm mostly familiar with the um, textbooks approaches with the anatomy very much. Um, don't have any, or not so much experience uh, myself table with these, but this was a, uh, this extended very much laterally to the contralateral side. Yeah. And one advantage of the of the of the addition of the posterior petrosectomy is just devascularization of the um, of the meningioma. And just in case there would have been um, an inferior attachment around the uh, petroclavial fissure, the inferior petrosal sinus, um, and in case the it would not have been a schwannoma, but a very solid fibrous meningioma, I think would have been a very different surgery. But then yeah. it would have been possible to go back via retrosig approach in another yeah. case. Uh, and by the way, no one, no one. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you what I would uh, have done. I, I think I would have started with the anterior petrosectomy personally, and then do it as a stage thing with retrosig. I completely agree with uh, with Mike on on this uh, on this topic. Um, but. Ken, amazing work. Uh, the fact that you could preserve all those cranial nerves coming from uh, that direction and get down as low as you did. Um, well, the tumor cooperated, <laughs> not having massive attachments anteriorly, but uh, masterful work and congratulations on that result. Uh, with that, uh, uh, thank you all the panelists for participating in this uh, very international episode of our uh, webinar. 
Um, I always tell a little bit about next time. Uh, I believe the next uh, rendition is going to be the, in the middle of August on the 19th. And I think uh, the case is coming out of Penn State. Uh, our discussant is uh, Professor Neil Nanda, uh, yet another past president of the NASBS. And uh, we are looking for a hot seater. So anybody who has any uh, hot seat and recommendations, uh, please uh, send me, uh, ping me on social media or on email. Um, again, uh, thank you, everybody, and I uh, learned a lot personally, and uh, have a good day, and um, see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.